uh, this uh, session. Um, really pleased to um, welcome you all, both here uh, in the conference room at the Calandra Institute, uh, but also online. Um, we'll have um, not just three, but four presentations. We've added Matthew Del Santo to this session. Um, so we might go on a little bit longer. So we're eating into your lunch break, but I think there'll be uh, such rich presentations and discussions to follow that I think is the right uh, thing for us to do. So let us uh, begin and I'll ask the speakers to keep their remarks to about 15, uh, maximum 18 minutes, and that will leave us lots of time uh, for questions and for the uh, ensuing discussion. Uh, so as I said, four speakers, and I'll uh, introduce them um, as they speak. So the first uh, speaker for this session, which is on Russia civilization and Western liberalism, is um, my colleague Richard Sackler, who's Professor of Russian and European Politics at the University of Kent, and who is joining us uh, from Nashville, Tennessee, uh, where he's currently attending another conference, but has uh, essentially been able to duck out uh, to present to us today, which is wonderful. So, uh, Richard, if I may ask you to um, both unmute yourself and switch on your camera if you can, and uh, I will then give you uh, the floor. And while Richard is uh, doing that, I'll briefly introduce the other speakers. Um, the second speaker is Paul Grenier, who's the founder and president of the Simone Bell uh, Center for Political Philosophy. The third speaker is Gabor uh, Rittersborn from the um, National Center of Scientific Research in Paris. And as I said, the fourth one is Matthew Del Santo, um, who's an independent uh, scholar. Um, Richard's uh, topic is the march of folly resumed, Russia, Ukraine, and the West. Uh, and there he is, uh, from Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, I bring you Richard Sackler. So Richard, thank you very much for joining us, and over to you. Lovely. Thank you very much, Adrian. Uh, it's lovely to be with you, if only in spirit, if not in body. Uh, so, uh, as you say, my topic is the march of folly. And uh, obviously the reference there is to that magnificent book by Bar Barbara Tuchman, who in my view is one of the most, was one of the most perceptive uh, analysts of the follies of humanity. And so uh, the book, and she defines folly as in the following way. She defines it as the pursuit of policy contrary to the self-interest of the constituency or state involved. Self-interest, is whatever conduces to the welfare or advantage of the body being governed. Folly is a policy that in these terms is counterproductive. Well, she describes that particular march of folly all the way from Troy, uh, taking in that uh, wooden horse all the way through to Vietnam. And of course we can take it beyond that. So how does this uh, concept uh, apply in our case? And as, as Adrian says, I'm currently at the International Studies Association conference in Nashville, Tennessee. And uh, yesterday we had a, as always, a, a great presentation from John Mearsheimer, the great structural realist, who argued that, uh, that the US, that if the US uh, had pursued its self-interest from his realist perspective, then it would have done uh, things very differently. And in particular, it would have worked with Russia to uh, establish uh, good relations. And of course, from his perspective, the goal is to focus on the epical struggle with China. So uh, that would have been the, the enlightened self-interest approach. As far as he's concerned, we had a period of liberal hegemony from 1990, uh, which ended in 2017, when Trump focused on a trade war um, against China and the containment of China and so on. In those years, 1990 to 2017, as far as uh, Mearsheim is concerned, we had a largely ideological foreign, well, the US had a largely ideological foreign policy. I, I won't go into detail, but one does not have to uh, buy into his argument to, uh, su to suggest that good relations with Russia, as Trump argued, made sense especially since Putin on coming to power in the year 2000 was the most pro-Western leader Russia has ever had. Uh, and, uh, you know, in, in a paper 
called uh, March of Folly, I outline the argument by Vladimir Posner. Some of you of perhaps uh, uh, greater vintage than a younger generation will remember Vladimir Posner, who's still going strong, by the way, as a commentator in the late Soviet years and uh, still on television in Russia, that the West, and in, in, a, in a famous uh, speech at Yale University a few years back, he argued that the West made Russia. By not pursuing its self-interest, it actually alienated what could have been an ally. And of course, it would have helped the transformation of Russia itself. Um, so this is the Mearsheimer argument there. He also extends it, and along with many others, that it would have made sense for, for Ukraine to have worked with Russia instead of becoming, what he argues, a pawn in the West's struggle with Russia. That enlightened self-interest, instead of the what he would suggest would be the folly after 2014, that uh, Ukraine should, uh, for, because of its geographical location, its historical links, uh, cultural links with Russia and so on, that instead of its you know, absolutely foolish attempt to uh, not to join the West is fine, but to have done it as, uh, as part of a struggle for the repudiation of those very civilizational links with Russia, then that was the height of folly, especially in the attempt to join NATO, where the prospect of joining NATO in the, uh, uh, in the immediate future and even in the uh, medium term future was not a realistic prospect anyway. So, I, I mean, we could return to Ukraine. As for Russia, um, why was it on this uh, forced march of folly? Uh, there you would have a, um, you know, a whole stack of things. And uh, initially the security concerns, then uh, uh, security concerns for the state and the regime, which is not the same thing, spilled over in a type of civilizational revolt against contemporary Western modernity. And this Putin's revolt against liberal modernity, one, uh, well, not phrasing it very well, what I mean is, was it doomed to fail? Was Russia's uh, revolt against modernity doomed to fail? In, and what was the parameters that maybe this was the height of folly? Would it have been wiser to have, for Russia to, post-communist Russia, to have accepted defeat gracefully after 1991, to have become, yes, okay, a subaltern, but nevertheless, the uh, public goods it would have gained would have been enormous. After all, it worked brilliantly for Germany and Japan after 1945. Yes, they were militarily defeated powers, yet uh, within the new framework, they have thrived. And also for the United Kingdom and France after the Suez debacle of 1956 accepted they were no longer superpowers, great powers even, and accepted their place in the dominant order, that civilization of modernity, which has provided so many public goods. Would it have meant uh, accepting, it would have meant accepting re-education by the European institutions, the Council of Europe and the European Union, and as it was willing to do in the 1990s. And of course, again, it would have meant the transformation of society. But of course, Russia was not a defeated power. It was one of the poles in what it considered was a multipolar world with the US, China, Russia, and more ambiguously, India. And of course, it couldn't have done it because of issues of status and identity. So it was uh, quite clearly not um, on the cards. And can I just spend a few seconds, a few minutes now on the uh, character of Russia's revolt against liberal modernity. When I initially was thinking about that, I actually titled it against liberal hegemony. But uh, liberal hegemony, you could argue, as a phase, and uh, Mersheimer makes his argument and others, lasted effectively from 1990 to 2017, when uh, US foreign policy in particular was highly ideological. Uh, since then, it's become uh, more, um, what he would argue, more realist. But this revolt, which you could say Russia has undertaken against liberal modernity, uh, has to be in, in it, it's a, 
can be seen as part of a much larger revolt. And it has been several books would argue about the post-Western world that Russia's alliance or alignment with China, Brazil, some other countries is a whole, um, a whole phenomenon. And that time of liberal, the dominance of liberal modernity anyway is waning. And uh, Russia is in the vanguard of that revolt. Well, um, possibly. Uh, but we have to understand his revolt, the Putin's revolt against modernity, in terms of the fundamentally fun paradoxical character of the Putin system, that the means adopted to achieve the goals in the long run determine the failure to achieve these goals. That's the fundamental paradox. I'm mean, quite simply put, for example, the pursuit of stability by mechanical, managerial, authoritarian means undermines the ability to achieve a more organic form of social integration and to achieve that very stability to which that system is dedicated. This doesn't mean to say that it doesn't hasn't achieved certain public goods and the security today compared to 20 years ago is fundamentally or was before the war uh, fun, was fundamentally much better. And indeed, this mechanical uh, attempt to manage economic and political affairs to maintain stability undermined the establishment of an equilibrium, uh, which would have been generated by more organic forms of stability. So we have the dual state phenomenon and many other elements. Uh, that whole section on uh, the revolt against the civilizational revolt against modernity, I think, or liberal modernity, is, is an important element. But because uh, I want to focus on the war today, I'm going to leave that to one side. So the question then becomes, why was the peace that was on offer after 1989, the end of the Cold War, and or after 91, the collapse of the Soviet Union, why was this peace so comprehensively lost? Uh, the Russia-Ukraine war from the 24th of February was 30 years in the making, and it was predictable, predicted, and in my view, avoidable. But just even saying that, of course, uh, raises all sorts of questions of methodology, but so, but I won't go into that. Uh, if we take, indeed, I'm sorry to go on about Mearsheimer so much, but uh, if we take his view that the structural preconditions for the conflict uh, were there for a long time, we still have to explain why it specifically took place when it did. Uh, at the moment, I'm making the analogy uh, a little bit like the uh, in a Chekhov play, when you have a pistol on the wall in Act One, you can be pretty sure that by the end of Act Five, that pistol would have been shot, that somebody would have pulled the trigger. But of course, it's a question of agency, of fate, of decisions, of character, which led to that point. So I think that just to take a simply a deterministic view is inadequate, that uh, the pistol was in the room, but it still took agency to fire it. And we need to understand the specific logic that led to the decision for war. And to do that, I argue that we've, we've had a tension between two models of post-Cold War peace after 1989, that, that, that we had two peace orders on offer, that uh, two peace orders, two, uh, two new, world, new world orders, to use the jargon of the time, um, H. George H. W. Bush used the term, were on offer when the Cold War ended. Briefly put, the first one is the model that was devised by the Soviet, by the Soviet Union, well, above all the United States, the Soviet Union, China, and other victors, which was constituted after 1945 in the form of what I call the Charter International System, focused on the United Nations, and a charter which combines state sovereignty, rights of national self-determination, and human rights. The UN Charter of 1945 bans war, as an instrument of policy and provides a framework for the peaceful resolution of international conflicts. The Charter Peace Order was given backbone by the creation of an internal concert of powers represented by the five permanent members of the UN Security Council, P5, 
uh, of US, Russia, China, France, and UK. It was to this international system that the Soviet Union Gorbachev appealed as the model of civilization and development as it launched into reforms at the end of the 1980s. This peace order was based on a modified form of great power politics with its associated lexicon of the balance of power, buffer states, and spheres of interest. However, it is modified by the type of international politics that it advocates, which tempers the great power logic. This is a model based on sovereign internationalism, where the respective interests of all the powers, great and small, are respected. It is based on sovereignty, but it's also modified by an internationalism based on a charter system. And it remains within the realist tradition of international politics. It was this model which was uh, outlined in that statement of Putin and Xi Jinping on the 4th of February, uh, just after the Beijing Olympics. Uh, and uh, in some 12, 13 pages, it was a resounding appeal to that model of international politics. You may say self-serving, hypocritical, uh, but it was certainly that it was uh, the foundation for the civilizational struggle because they were appealing to this the impartiality of an international system because what Russia and China and to a degree Ch India were concerned about is what you could argue uh, a politics of substitution and this is where that second new world order that second peace order on offer after 1989 comes in and this is the one more narrowly created and led by the US. Also at the end of the war, in the 19th century, Great Britain acted as a champion of free trade, open navigation, and this was now assumed by the US after 1945. This is a model based on liberal internationalism, consisting of uh, that open trading and financial system, which uh, in the framework of Bretton Woods uh, Agreement of 1944, as well as a military arm, this is uh, above all the uh, uh, foundation of NATO the develop in the context of the developing first Cold War. Um, and of course, the vast network of US military allies, which by the way, at this conference in Nashville International Studies has been much, uh, much talk about how Biden is reinforcing and reestablishing that liberal uh, order. Uh, working with allies, building up coalitions, building up military alliances, and so on. So this second model, it was, of course, liberal only in the, uh, context, in the context of Cold War. It meant anti-communist rather than liberal democratic, uh, and hence the many interventions in its name. Yet it provided a powerful and ultimately successful framework to overcome the Soviet adversary. It was a hegemonic peace order dominated by the US and its allies. And after the end of the Cold War and the disintegration of the USSR in 1991, it proclaimed itself, not only the, uh, its victory, but also its universality. There could be no separate spheres of influence since the leadership of the US led hegemonic peace was proclaimed as a global and universal project. In effect, a global Monroe doctrine was applied. Cold War bipolarity was gone, and in the subsequent unipolar years, there was no one left to contest the assertion. Moscow grumbled in uh, the 1990s, but was no position to challenge, uh, while China used the opportunity to engineer its quiet guys with the support of the United States, one has to say. Uh, this model was, uh, you couldn't quite call it idealist, uh, because of the end. Uh, expansionary uh, power system at its core, yet this expansive system perceived as aggressive to outsiders is became liberal hegemony after 1989 and universal. So we've got two peace orders on offer. And this was an extraordinary uh, achievement. Uh, and peace, it seemed after, this, this is what makes the tragedy of this war and why I constantly stress the notion of folly, because it seemed almost after 1989 that this question of peace was overdetermined. It seemed everything was working towards it. And so the, the almost gratuitous follow to lead to this war uh, certainly strikes me and many, many of my colleagues. Why was peace determined? 
uh, uh, overdetermined, and maybe uh, this will be my final points. It was overdetermined first because of the superfluity of peace orders. If we'd only had one peace order, then it would have perhaps been better. But instead of, it's like a London bus, you wait ages for one to turn up and then two come along at the same time, the ones which I've just mentioned. Also, the second reason why it was overdetermined was the hubristic assumptions built into the model of liberal hegemony, that it built on its interpretation of a post-Cold War peace order, which was definitely peaceful. Many elements contributed to this, including ideological, end of history narratives meant that uh, there was a right side of history and of course then therefore a wrong side. Uh, it, a reproduction of Manichaean Cold War um, block mentalities, uh, well, yet, but uh, it was it was over This peace order was overdetermined because the uh, liberal assumption, excuse me, um, was um, th this liberal assumptions built into it were so intensely powerful. The third overdetermination of the peace order was globalization, naive views about interdependency and economic achievement, transforming societies. The fourth overdetermination of peace was the long peace idea that with nuclear weapons who would dare to go to war uh, which of course is absolutely astonishing in the current war the discounting of the dangers of nuclear conflict uh, which is in fact the legacy of this overdetermined peace view that they couldn't possibly end up at war we couldn't possibly use nuclear weapons in this conflict and so on so that whole mentality overdetermined mentality and fifthly the robust multilateralism which had developed uh, certainly uh, after 1945 but in, above all after 1989 so if peace was so overdetermined why did we end up with an extended uh, cold peace for 30 years and then a second cold war today and in fact a hot war uh, so, which of course is far more dangerous, far worse, far more intense than ever it was in the first Cold War. Well, I'm not going to be able to uh, go fully into that, but to return to my very first point, that it was this foolish inability to create an inclusive and indivisible peace order. And so in the, the fact that we had two different models of peace orders at the end of the Cold War, and the battle today was over which one would dominate, which one would work. In other words, that Russia could have aligned, and I began it by saying, with that liberal model, but it didn't. Not because it was, I mean, of course, it was dysfunctional in all sorts of ways, but not because of its perhaps inherent uh, darkness and so on, but because it actually clung to a different vision of a peace order and the tragedy of our times is that because we had these two peace orders, the struggle then became about the normative basis, as far as I say Russia and China are concerned, that the liberal peace order has acted as not only a substitute, it's actually usurped the internationalism, the sovereign internationalism based on the charter international system. So that is the generation, it generated conflict, which of course exploded into war. That doesn't justify, of course, the decision to pull the trigger on the 24th of February this year, but it hopefully begins to uh, explain why this constant ambiguity in all of those documents of the post-Cold War years, the Helsinki Final Act even before the end of the Cold War, the Paris Charter for Peace, um, the Istanbul um, for New Europe, the Istanbul documents, the Astana documents, all of them have within them embedded this tension between two peace orders, the indivisibility of uh, security on the one side and the free choice of nations to choose their own security alignment secondly. So it's out of almost a normative struggle uh, that we end up in conflict today, but a bit of goodwill Good statesmanship, statecraft could have meant the resolution because the, they were not incompatible. And yet, because of this onward march of folly, we failed to overcome these divisions. And hence, we've now ended up back in war. So I'll stop there. Thank you.
there will be many questions, uh, no doubt, when we come to it. Um, but before I open up the floor, I think best to um, continue with the presentations. Um, so let me um, then introduce uh, the second um, presentation for, for this morning. Um, is liberalism a civilization? The view from the Russian right, from Timburski to Krylov. Uh, Paul Grenier is the speaker. Paul, very warm welcome, uh, and over to you. Everything working? Yes, we can hear you. Please. Okay, yes. Um, so that, that, thank you, uh, Richard. That was fascinating and um, it's actually creates a, a good context for the remarks I am um, about to, tr to try to make in 18 uh, minutes if I can. Uh, I think one thing that strikes me, Richard, and I, I know we're not supposed to be going into discussion quite yet, but it seemed like the decision was between uh, international orders that allow for civilizational difference and an international order that didn't. And so I think that my talk might be useful for understanding um, why from at least the conservative wings and the right in, in Russia, uh, why there was such a, a resistance to, to, um, to becoming a, the, the pupil of the liberal West. So and I, this is really going to be focusing on, on Konstantin Krylov, um, who's not well known yet in the West, um, but he was very influential and part of the social milieu of the entire uh, Russian conservative uh, movement um, over the probably the past 20 years until he, his death in 19, uh, 2020 of, of a stroke. So for, for Konstantin Krylov, uh, what we observe in the world today is the West's gradual decline into something less than the civilization uh, that it once was. Uh, the West is adapting something that mimics liberalism, uh, mimics liberalism, but which compared to uh, the, the actual liberalism uh, is, is something cruder and more militant and less tolerant. Uh, mind you that these uh, the, the views expressed here by Krylov were made by him in 1995 and 1996 when he wrote the book, which is the focus of my uh, talk here. The civilization that Russia belongs to is not liberal. In several respects, it is the opposite of liberalism. Complicating the, the, the picture, the Russia uh, for Krylov what never actually fully yet has come into its own as, a civil, as the civilization that it is. Uh, it's lingered in this sort of pre-civilizational, quasi-civilizational maturity state. Um, at the same time, um, while the West was still a genuinely liberal civilization, despite being different from Russia as a civilization, an accommodation was possible uh, still with Russia. But the, the decayed form of that liberalism, liberalism was evolving into for Krylov um, meant that such a modus vivendi with Russia would become uh, increasingly uh, impossible. Uh, meanwhile, to the extent that Russia comes into its own on the basis of its own civilizational idea, the propensity for conflict, unfortunately, is only going to grow. But that, in summary form, are the you know, the overall implications of, of Konstantin Krylov's uh, analysis of civilizations and ethics uh, based on his ethical theory, which we'll get into soon. Uh, I think it's probably important given particularly the obscurity of, of Krylov uh, in, in the West, it's, it's important to point out uh, that this general view of his about the sharp difference between these, uh, the two different uh, civilizations Russia's in the West is something which is absolutely standard uh, for all mainstream Russian conservative thought thought on the right, Russian uh, uh, Russian thinkers of a more nationalist bent, uh, and Krylov was definitely the leader, the intellectual leader by a long shot of the more nationalist voices among uh, Russian conservatism. To save time, I'll skip over some of the thoughts that I wanted to share about Mirzhuev on this point. Um, I think what's important is that even though um, such analysts as Marlene Lowell have uh, pointed out uh, that the democratic conservatives such as uh, Boris Mirzhuev and, and Mikhail Remizov um, 
to an extent, Yegor Kolmogorov. They're deeply familiar with Western culture. They know what the Western thinkers and Western philosophers, and that that's deceptive. It make, gives us the impression that they're part of the West. It, in a sense, as thinkers, they are, but in their analysis of Russia, they do not. None of them consider Russia to be part of the West. And um, as we've recently acknowledged on Russian national TV uh, that uh, the break with the West was now permanent and, and, and final. And, and that it's re and re not only that, but reflective of the reality of the situation. They belong to different civilizations for all of these thinkers, as far as I can tell. Um, and we can, I'm gonna skip over at Simbursky, although we can maybe return to that if people are interested in, in, in his thinking, which is also extremely influential um, in, in, among Russian conservatives. So uh, now I'm gonna go directly into Krilov's uh, definition of liberalism, uh, which is important to understanding uh, the nature of the difference. The, interestingly though, he, uh, Krilov died in 2020 at the age of 52, uh, suddenly of a stroke, had nothing to do with COVID. Um, in October of 2021, I was at a book launch uh, of the published publication for the first time of, uh, of his book, uh, uh, his, his eth ethical uh, theory and categorization of civilizational types published in a book called Pavidenia, or Behavior. Again, this was uh, the book itself he wrote in 95, 1996, but this was the first time it appeared, was appearing in print in any language, of course, in, in the original Russian. Now, for Krilov, the difference between civilizations is defined not by political boundaries uh, or geography. It's defined by a social collective's um, more or less consistent application of one of what he believes to be the four basic institu institu uh, intuitions about uh, the principles of right behavior. If a, if a collectivity is civilized, it uh, holds to some consistently shared norm of behavior with corresponding requirements of justice, which I won't go into uh, today um, for brevity's sake. Um, and so according to this theme of four basic intuitions of behavior and therefore civilizations, liberalism uh, comes out as the third of the four possible ethical systems. Um, it's also associated with the West by Krilov and each of the others have their own designation um, with Russia's being uh, the civilization of the North. And Krilov also defines his ethical systems. So the, the, the heart of his theory is this mathematical formulation, which takes the form of an ought that is functionally related to an is. So according to the first ethical system, which we will mostly ignore, called the civilization of the South, right behavior is defined as, I should behave toward others, I should behave toward others as others behave toward me. In, in that civilization, the right behavior or virtue means is largely a matter of following what others do and being obedient. And it's obviously a very conservative idea. The second ethical system, which he associates with the East, not necessarily geographically, recalls the biblical golden rule uh, expressed in, in negative form. I should not do to others what others do not do to me. Uh, and so in his exposition on this, in, in, in the book, Krilov points to examples of India, uh, to a lesser extent, uh, Japan, particularly ancient India, Japan, Korea, to some extent, China. Uh, and obviously, as he acknowledges, all of these cultures have absorbed uh, a lot of liberal Western civilization, but to the extent they remain true to their own, civilizational ethic, they remain conservative and, and mostly history bound. So let's focus mainly though on, on his uh, categories three and four, um, given that the, uh, the liberal West the, the, is, is the third and the fourth is Russia. Now about the third liberal ethical system, 
according to Krilovitz, ethic reads as follows. Others should behave toward me as I behave toward them. So Krilovitz believes that this is the foundational ethic of the whole of liberalism. In it, the individual's choice comes to the fore. Uh, and yet within the liberal civilization, it's a choice that faces a constraint because others get to treat me, treat me the same way as I treat them for better or worse. Liberalism says Krilov is a culture of live and let live. One that says leave, leave others alone to do their own thing. And if you don't like it, you can always go the other way. Liberalism is a culture that says, if you played the game and you lost, you only have yourself to blame. Now, this liberal civilization, according to Krilov, has dominated the world as a whole for centuries now. And in the 1990s, when he was writing his book, it was also in the driver's seat in Russia. A liberal civilization for him has its virtues, some of them admirable to him as well, even though they're very different from Russia's civilizational virtues. An ethic of leaving others alone to do their own thing serves, serves as a powerful stimulant to innovation. Its ethic of competition stimulates economic growth. Um, it's not conservative, unlike the first two, the, the, the civilizations of the, the South and the East. And cons, cons categorical imperative is viewed by Krilov as a typical expression of the liberal ethical system. At the same time, the third ethic makes a virtue of envy. Instead of considering greed and egotism, the striving for pleasures, riches, and fame to be vices, liberalism welcomes them, considering them to be the engines of social change and development. So I hopefully we're doing okay for a time. It looks like I have another six and a half minutes. Um, now, there's a complication which is actually the most important part, I think, of Krilov's theory and what, what made it seem to, to be seem so useful. I, I mentioned at the opening of the talk that for Krilov, the civilization of the West, uh, the liberalism is moving to an uncivilized version of its own ethic. But what, what did he mean by that? So each of the, every ethical system has a distorted mirror image, which could be mistakenly taken as being for all intents and purposes, the same thing, but which in reality, is anything, is, is not, it really is, it's, it's something uh, qualitatively different. And Krilov has a term for this uh, characteristic deformation or simplification of cultures, which I've translated as an impost. Uh, I won't go into the etymology, you can think of it as in, impost, sort of imposture or a fake, if you wish. The impost version of a civilization revolts, results from a simplification of the original equation. So in the case of liberalism, it states instead of others should behave toward me as I behave toward them, it becomes others should behave as I behave. And this is, this is quite intriguing because it, it captures, I think something that we, we can now see clearly that you know, with, with the wokeism and political correctness as well as geopolitical behavior, the liberal uh, project, including the one that Richard just described, is, is about other countries should behave as America behaves, uh, as liberals behave. Now, this formulation has obvious political advantages. It's very simple. It's simpler than the first, than the, the, the true, the full form of liberalism, and that makes it more easily understood by anyone. It's also aggressive and militant. Uh, though uh, capable of still, though illicitly, declaring itself tolerant and open. Krilov states that this imposture or impost version of the liberal civilization has become widespread throughout the liberal world, especially in the case of the United States. This ethic has been used as the engine of global expansion. And it appears to appears to the people inside of the liberal world that they're doing what's good and right. Now, let's talk. Let's turn, if we can, uh, quickly to his ethic of the North, uh, his description of what Russia actually is as a civilization. Uh, briefly, it, it's its inner logic is that others should not behave toward me, as I do not behave towards others. Again, the same mathematical sort of formulation. 
Now, according to how does it get this? The interesting part is how he unpacks this. What does that imply? What it implies is that I should, what I consider impermissible as such is impermissible for others as well. Um, in philosophical and metaphysical terms, um, another key point is that the, the form of the Russian idea is that it is committed to the resistance to evil. Interestingly, um, and parenthetically, this is something a point Krilov doesn't make, but think of the fact that Ivan Ilin, allegedly super influential on Putin, uh, wrote a book called The Resist Resistance to Evil by Force. But the very different, more allegedly liberal Vladimir Solovyov wrote a book, The Free Conversation on War, Progress and the End of History, which had exactly the same import. It was about the resistance to evil by force. I think that's very important data points. In any case, um, the, for, for Krilov, what, what's distinctive of the fourth ethical system is that it's oriented to the future. It's not conservative, it's oriented to action. Um, and this suggests to me that the Silver Age philosophers like Solovyov and Bulgakov and Berdyaev uh, with their non-static, non-conservative uh, sort of um, Sophianic, if you wish, spirituality um, fits, also it seems to me fits into this fourth uh, I, um, ethical system. The, although the ethic of the North, which is oriented to the non-acceptance of what it considers evil, could hardly be more unlike the live and let live spirit of the liberal ethical civilization, this contrast does not necessarily imply a war between the two. Isolationism, at least for the people like Mejuev and Vadim Simburski, um, is also an option. Um, they, they're both rather isolationist in their view. But to the extent that the West embraces that less civilized form, the new form, uh, which we call the impost form, which declares live as we live, then a battle between the Russian North and liberal West becomes unavoidable. But there's a, one final uh, complication to this whole scheme, which is that Russia, for Krylov, has only very partially entered into its own civilizational status. For most of recent history, at any rate, Russia has existed as a hybrid civilization that has borrowed from one or the other of the three, first three civilizational types, and has combined this only with the distorted imposture or impost version of its own ethical system. Now, that system, as we, uh, as I pointed out, says no one should do um, the, 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 the impost or the simplified version says no one should do what I don't do or better or more clearly, no one should have what I don't have. That's, that's the simplified version which still to some extent reigns in Russia and why the Russian civilization is perhaps less uh, attractive than it could be. And it, we, you know, we, many historians could recall that as being characteristic of the Russian peasant who doesn't want to see anyone, to, want, doesn't want to see anyone richer than he is. And, and for Krilov that became very much the, the economic ideal under communism. Now, by the 1990s, Russia had it adapted uh, once again, rather characteristically for Russia, an alien ethical system, this time liberalism and capitalism, which it continued to combine with the defective version of its own Northern ethic. Now, a question that naturally um, follows is, is this one, isn't the, the Northern ethic of Russia, which seeks to fight evil, is it very similar to the simplified version of liberalism, which also fights evil? Now, given that we're running out of time, um, Adrian, would you like me to just cut off the end of my, my talk at this point, or what, what would be best? Yeah, if you could wrap up in the next two, two minutes or so, Paul, and then okay. maybe- well, I, I can do that, if you, you give me two minutes, sure. Two minutes is absolutely fine. Okay, great. We'll, we'll um, Thank you. And just wave your hands if I go beyond two. So, the, so it, I, I just think that it's interesting that how, how Krulov, I can only speculate how Krulov would respond to this question about um, the allegedly unique character of Russia's struggle uh, uh, as a civilization against evil. I think this dif the difference though works like this. 
Um, and, and the way to understand it is, is to return to the, the Kant's ethical uh, rule, which, um, which he viewed as paradigmatically liberal and as do many others. Uh, so what is the characteristic of, of Kant's thought in general is that the metaphysical realm is unknowable. And, so, and that's which is why his ethical system is purely formal. And to just that extent, it doesn't really make ontological claims. So we know what is, we do not know for Kant what is good in its essence. Therefore, whatever is taken to be good by the individual is given the formal status of being as if it were the good. So Kant's formalism has a natural affinity for this, for that same reason, for the live and that live liberal ethic. Um, and the militant, the militant simplified version of liberalism, which says do as I do, remains just as ontologically and metaphysically empty as the original form. And, but in the, now the absence of any justification ontologically for its moral outrage uh, makes them, the moral campaigns all the more intense. And they follow one another in rapid succession because that only that the emotional momentum and novelty can be appealed only by that rapid succession of, of moral outrages and, and, and campaigns. Meanwhile, the whole spirit of the Northern ethic by contrast is that it participates in the ontological and metaphysical. And that's that, and I think in this connection, the, 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 my appeal earlier to Solovyov and Ilin, to say nothing of Berdyaev and, and Father Bulgakov, uh, it, to the extent that I'm right in seeing them as parts of the Northern civilizational ethic, makes clear why Russian civilization would never give up uh, its uh, commitment to, to fighting the, what it sees as a, as a very different Western civilization, which to, to an extent embodies things which are ontologically and uh, metaphysically untrue and, and, uh, and unjust. The, I, I, I think I, I'd better end there, but um, perhaps in the discussion, some of the stuff I had to cut out, we can get back to. Right, thank you uh, very much uh, indeed, Paul. Um, for, for that very rich presentation. We will indeed have some time uh, in the discussion, but let us move on to the third presentation uh, by Gabor uh, Rittersborn, uh, entitled Society, Politics and Civilization in Russia. Gabor, uh, welcome. I know you speak <coughs> from Paris, so, <coughs> um, and uh, very pleased to have you here. The floor is yours. Uh, good afternoon. I'm sorry, I have two caveats. One is that I'm sure I have a very bad cold and sometimes I'm going to cough. The second is that my uh, Wi-Fi is very uh, unstable and I can't do a thing about it. <coughs> Gabo, if it helps, do, do switch off the camera if it helps the sound, that's absolutely fine. We have now uh, seen you in the... Uh, yes, flash. it's uh, okay. If you prefer to switch off your camera, I think we will be uh, very forgiving of that. Thank you. Russia is not a civilizational state. Even if, if Russians are not entirely mistaken to think that they have a peculiar civilization which may or may not determine the parameters of their existence. Still, one may wonder if a state can be civilizational. An ensemble of administrations and agencies may represent distinct and more or less easily recognizable cultural patterns. But these, <laughs> <coughs> but these patterns rarely amount to a whole civilization, which comprises practices and mentalities of the rest <coughs> of the rest of society. That is not necessarily. <coughs> <I'm sorry. coughs> it is not necessarily <coughs> in tune with state sponsored values. The identification of well defined models of behavior and reasoning and the formulation of related discourses are the occupation of individuals or groups specializing in intellectual persons. Usually they belong to elite society or to people gravitating around it. One of the first and most recognized authorities 
from Russian civilization, Pyotr Chadayev, did not address the average leader. He wrote his celebrated essay in French, the language of Russia's utmost classes of his days. Army officers were instructed during, the Napole during Napoleon's Russian campaign to avoid speaking French among themselves because peasants were likely to take them for the enemy and risk killing them. Suffice to say that uh, the explorers of the supposedly authentic universe of the people have few chances to belong to the rank, rank and file society. Nothing guarantees that the discoveries of the explorers reveal uh, the actual world of an anti-society. Sometimes they tell more about the milieu of our explorers than about the civilization they are trying to describe. Their discourses can influence public thinking, but the origins and the uses of these discourses and the milieu which cultivate them encourage one to speak about civilizational establishments rather than civilizational states. It is possible that this caveat must uh, make concern also foreign observers whose views are likely to be imported to, in Russia. Also, it is conceivable and sometimes argued that the vision of a Russian civilization that represents the antipode of Western values contributes to the construction of Western self-understanding. But this is not the subject of my expose. Be that as it may, the Russian talk about the Russian civilization fulfills roughly three functions. One of them is interpretive. It is tempting to explain the Russian past, present and future in terms of traditions bequeathed by ancient times and sufficiently tenacious to survive without losing their potency. These traditions may amount to a sort of negative utopia in the sense that they supposedly account for all the vices of Russian society can represent or for the ones its critic, critics attribute to it. The second function is related to this utopia. It is largely apologetic. The vices in question may be invoked by elites, their organic intellectuals, and in general by anyone in need of justifying whatever happens or doesn't happen in a society in which they usually do not belong to the lower strata. Needless to say that quite often this negative utopia serves to put the blame on the masses. The third function is eulogizing. The exaltation of supposedly of supposed civilizational virtues favors the cultivation of self-esteem and may motivate people to face difficulties and adversity. According to the official discourse of our days, the greatest achievements the Soviet regime bequeathed on contemporary Russia happened to be the victory in the Second World War and the conquest of the space. They suggest that there are no obstacles which Soviet society can overcome. These discourses have something messianic about them. Russians can deliver mankind of the worst enemy of humanity, and they can vanquish the heavens. The cult of the victory could inspire three generations, which one way or another contributed to it, suffered the war as well as their kin, their friends, and their direct descendants. But it commemorates an event which is more and more distant from our time and its consequences. People begin to be tired of the richer glorification of the victory, and they are increasingly curious about the hidden history of the war. So much that a recent, <coughs> that a recent law penalizes the denigration of the victory <coughs> and attempts to compare Stalinism and Nazis. Uh, the space saga suggested a glorious technical revolution, which curiously announced the advent of prosperity to many citizens of a country 
where food shortages were not uncommon and where it was not easy to buy a pair of decent socks. Persistence poverty outlived the optimism. In fact, the optimism didn't survive the early American successes in the cosmos. A few days after the first walk of a US astronaut on the moon, someone scribbled in the guest book of a newly opened uh, subway station in an outlying district of Moscow that, I'm quoting him, it is more important to us than the American moon. Wasn't he right? President Putin doesn't necessarily back the best horses, but he wants to inspire people with talk about the war and the Soviet space program. He cannot revive Bolshevik messianism, which announced the redemption through Soviet type communism and seduced people way beyond the frontiers of the coming paradise. Gone are the times when the promise of this paradise motivated millions of Soviet citizens to cope with the trial of the war and with the misery in peaceful times. The Bolsheviks succeeded in creating social practices, symbols, and even traditions, which gathered masses of people around their regime for about three generations. The symbols were closely related to the originality of the system, to its modernizing zeal, to its paternalism, to its striving to become an example to follow by the whole world, and to its status as a great power. Their appeal became increasingly weakened by the last decades of the USSR, and Soviet traditions became irrelevant under the new regime. The new regime doesn't appear as original. It cannot pose as an example for the world. It doesn't modernize. It barely cares of its citizens. It lost its great power status. It doesn't amount to a civilization worth cherishing and fighting for. Russian politicians wisely avoid the temptation of advertising their country abroad as an example to imitate. Instead of exalting the universal merits of Russian civilization, they want the world to accept their fatherland as integral part of modernity and not as a standard bearer in a civilizational conflict. The eventual virtues of Russian civilization do not prevent people to experience in their everyday lives that their land occupies the 61st place in the world in terms of per capita income. It doesn't produce coveted and prestigious paraphernalia of modernity. It doesn't produce uh, uh, computers, mobile phones, TV sets, or electronic household appliances. People shun Russian made cars, among other things, because they cannot compete as status symbols with foreign models. Politicians and officials ride Mercedes and BMW cars, even hyper patriots who are seriously convinced of the superiority of what they take for Russian civilization over the civilizations of the rest of the world. The fact that such icons of the rich West are beyond the means of most of uh, the population may motivate hostility toward the Occident. Whatever the case, the hostility is not strong enough to provoke iconoclasm. As usual in authoritarian regimes, top decision makers are largely independent from the rest of Russian society and free to try implementing unpopular policies. They can justify them with alleged uh, peculiarities of a putative Russian civilization. But as a rule, their actions are not motivated by, by them when it comes to foreign affairs. Russian policies are pragmatic and opportunistic. The most often they are launched in function of specific conjunctures and not based on civilizational considerations. The Kremlin was ready to uh, seize an occasion to occupy Crimea that the public sees as Russian because it faced the failed state. Its interventions in Libya or Syria have nothing to do with civilizational values. They are attempts to gain footholds in countries weakened by civil wars. The present adventure in Ukraine is no exception. Putin and his cronies seized an occasion at a moment when the impotence of the West became obvious 
and open them the opportunity to settle scores with their troublesome neighbor, create a buffer zone between Russia and the East European neighbor states, hurt Western sensibilities, and claim superpower status. The official discourse is increasingly addressing the relevance of cultural norms to concerns far removed uh, from the cultural sphere. Laws, ukases, and pragmatic documents of the government on political strategies stress that cultural matters, that, uh, that cultural matters and civilizational identities are closely related to national security. The two, uh, 2015 guidelines on national security feature prominently the de defense, I'm quoting, of the country's civilizational distinctiveness and the thesis that the cultural civilizational identity is no less significant than economic indicators and military power. And of course, the document emphasizes that Russia is a multi-ethnic state and therefore the culture of each nationality and the identity of each ethnic group are also involved. The 20, uh, 2021 uh, guidelines devote an entire chapter to uh, uh, quoting the defense of Russia's traditional spiritual and moral values, culture, and historical memory, end of quote. The defense of historical truth seems so important that in the same year, uh, Putin instituted, I quote the name, an interagency committee for historical education to secure, I'm quoting, the assertion, the assertion of national interests of the Russian Federation related to the defense of historical truth and the preservation of historical memory alongside with the averting of attempts at the falsification of historical facts. And of course, the historical memory seems to be in grave danger because the ministries of defense and internal affairs, as well as the agencies of foreign intelligence and, international, and internal security are also represented on the committee that is the most competent authorities in the field of historical truth. In January this year, the Kremlin published a project of a presidential ukaz about, I could title, the fundamentals of state politics to preserve and strengthen the spiritual and moral values of Russia. <coughs> the authors argued that the regime, and in particular, particular could, the state-forming Russian people that is, uh, not of uh, Russia, which would involve the all ethnic groups, <coughs> are in danger because of attempts at weakening the civic identity and unity of the multinational pe people of the country. End of case. For a good part, the origin of the danger is supposedly foreign and especially US subversion. At stake are, well, the civilizational identity and the unified cultural space of the country. <coughs> this is the national people of Russia. <coughs> the project proposed <coughs> measures ranging from sociological surveys to faintly dis uh, disguised uh, censorship. It was published on January 21st on the government uh, website of legislative documents <coughs> and evaporated from there by February 14th. According to the Ministry of Culture, it needs revision. <coughs> One of uh, the reasons of the disappearance was that unusually and inadvertently, <coughs> the Kremlin allowed readers to cast the vote. <coughs> 100,000 uh, of the readers can I ask accept. To wrap up I'm sure. A couple of minutes, please. Yes, 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 okay. Thank you. <coughs> 100,000 of the readers accepted the project and 80,000 80, of them rejected it. And this under a regime 
where the most often the government's initial initiatives are acclaimed by the great majority of the population. <laughs> <laughs> there seems to be a difference between the vision of the Russian civilization and or the civilization of Russia by the state and by the rest of society. Thank you for your patience. Thank you very much, Gabo. That was uh, really interesting. And <coughs> I know it involved some struggle, but thank you very much for, um, for doing that. So we turn to our fourth and final presentation. Um, by Matthew uh, Dal Santo on um, Hagia Sophia, God and Empire of Liberalism. Um, Matthew, if you could both unmute yourself and switch on your camera, that would be fantastic. Uh, wi Fi quality allowing. Yeah, hi, Adrian, can you hear me? Yes, we can certainly. Yeah, I am having trouble putting on my camera for some reason. Okay, absolutely fine. Um, here yeah. you are clear, so please go ahead. Yeah. And um, all right, thank you. And thank you for allowing me to uh, catch up, as it were. Um, it, it's, it's actually sort of fortunate because although the title uh, of my um, uh, paper doesn't can, uh, indicate that I shall talk about Russia, um, I shall spend quite a lot of time, um, in fact, talking about Russia. So there is a um, good logical connection. Um, Okay, so let me begin. Uh, when this paper was first proposed, the Turkish government's termination of Hagia Sophia's status as a museum and its reconsecration, if that's the right word, as a mosque, had just been announced and was being lamented in dramatic terms by everybody from Ursula von der Leyen, um, the uh, president of the European Commission, to the Pope. And even if they did not use precisely the terms I shall use, it seems everybody um, had intuited what the gesture meant. Hagia Sophia possessed a symbolic meaning greater than itself. It wasn't only that a building that for 90 years had been a museum was becoming once again a place of worship. It was rather that a building that had served for centuries as the symbol of one idea had in recent historical time become the symbol of its opposing value in a way that many of us outside Turkey considered desirable final definitive and as in some way implicating us and the logic of our own societies. Well, what was that idea and what was its opposing value? I think that attention to um, Hagia Sophia's desacralization um, sheds light on much more than just the fate of one of the world's great buildings. Um, I think it. Um, I, I think that it, it, it leads us towards the conclusion that um, civilization states and liberal empire are bound to collide, and that the so-called special operation taking place as we speak um, by Russian forces in Ukraine um, reflects something of that um, collision. Um, in, on that light, I mean, I, I, I shall make some remarks that could be interpreted as, as controversial, and, and uh, I would just like to express my full um, sorrow. Um, at what is taking place, um, scarcely a couple of days drive from where I am here in Copenhagen, um, uh, uh, you know, the, the tragic and wholly, wholly, I think, avoidable nature of that of those events, um, I would like to underline. In any case, the case that I'm making here will be um, uh, historical, philosophical, um, and to make it, I will draw on the philosophies of history um, of the Russian Orthodox priest, theologian, and philosopher, Sergei Bulgakov, and the Italian Catholic scholar of Marxism and philosopher of history, um, Augusto da Noce. Bulgakov um, may not have been one of the most influential Orthodox theologians of the 20th century, though I can think of others who are more influential, but he certainly has a good claim to being one of the greatest. Um, theologically, Bulgakov is often considered a man of the left, a progressive, um, even um, a liberal, depending on how you um, define that word. The standard English language biography um, bears the title The Cross and the Sickle. But I think the reality, when we start to look at uh, Bulgakov's own um, uh, autobiographical um, notes in particular, the reality is somewhat less straightforward. Bulgakov is neither of the left nor of the right. Neither is he a progressive or a conservative, at least not in the way those terms are usually understood. He is sui generis, perhaps, but still more, I think, he is orthodox and he is Russian. Indeed, uh, reading uh, Bulgakov's autobiography is an interesting experience because what we learn is that what he was, in a sense, hiding from his colleagues, his more progressive colleagues and contemporaries um, in the final days 
um, of the Russian Empire a century ago, was that despite having rejected orthodoxy in his youth for the alliance it had made with the Tsarist state, in his heart, he had since become, as he put it himself, a Tsarist. He couldn't help himself. It was a question of love, not rational calculation. And I quote a passage from um, Bulgakov's autobiographical notes. This love was born in my soul suddenly, silently, he said, when I met the Tsar from a distance at Yalta in 1909. I should say that um, when Bulgakov refers to the Tsar, he always capitalizes the word as if it's the idea rather than necessarily the historical personage of Nicholas II that he's talking about. Um, I met the Tsar at Yalta on the embankment in 1909. I sensed that the Tsar too bore his authority like the cross of Christ, and that obedience to him could also be the cross of Christ and carried out in his name. In my soul, the idea of holy Tsarist authority lit up like a bright star, and, the light, and in the light of this idea, the characteristics of Russian history also lit up and glittered like gems. Where, where formerly I saw emptiness, lies, Orientalism, there now glittered the divinely inspired idea of authority by the grace of God and not by popular dispensation, end quote. Giving this regime by the grace of God a name, and that name was Theokratia, Bulgakov believed that he had suddenly discovered um, uh, that Russia as an idea made sense. As, as, as Theokratia, Russia was to be the image on earth of the kingdom of God that so, sure, so, sure enough, was not of this world, that transcended this world, but had not, um, uh, for all that, abandoned this world. By 1917, however, this erotic allegiance, so to speak, to Theokratia had become for Bulgakov the source of agony. The whole revolution I experienced, he said, um, I experienced as a tragedy, as the death of all that which was for me dearest, sweetest, and most precious in Russian life. No longer by the grace of God, authority in Russia had become by popular dispensation. Bulgakov's contemporaries, indeed his friends, rejoiced. Democracy as a regime type, if not yet as an electoral system, had arrived and not a moment too soon. Bulgakov, however, was sullen. And it's here that we return to Hagia Sophia. And we do so because at the same time that the monarchy was being overthrown in Russia, of course, in the spring of 1917, being assembled in the Black Sea ports of what is modern Ukraine, um, was, an, was a Russian armada under the command of Admiral Kolchak. The purpose of that armada was, of course, of that armada was the seizure of Constantinople. That Russian victory in the World War would, seize, would see Russia seize the straits and the cross restored to Hagia Sophia was widely looked forward to in Russia in 1917, and Bulgakov was no exception. Indeed, in his 1918 dialogue at the Feast of the Gods, he put into the mouth of a Tsarist general his own hope that the Russian annexation of Constantinople, which Bulgakov calls um, by its sort of uh, religious name, Zagrad, would put an end to the Petersburg period in Russian history and inaugurate a new Byzantine one, where the Russian theokratia, casting off the distorting, distorting because secular German bureaucracy of Petersburg, would become more truly itself. But Bulgakov had not reckoned with the unexpected course of history. He later recalled, I loved the Tsar, wanted Russia only with the Tsar, and without the Tsar, Russia to me was no longer Russia. My soul's first movement, half conscious it was so deep after the monarchy fell um, and the revolution was completed, was yes, war to a victory, victorious end. But what for? What was the point of victory now uh, without a Tsar? What was the point of Tsargrad when there was no Tsar in Russia? To be sure, for the Tsar, Tsargrad was fitting. Um, uh, but the thought that into this Zagrad might arrive the provisional government with, it, with, with Kerensky and Milyukov was to me such a disgusting, such a painful and distressing thought that I felt in my heart a cold and deathly emptiness. Now, these word, words from Bulgakov's autobiographical notes on Hagia Sophia, or, or on Constantinople rather, were not published during his lifetime. But in a text that he did publish in 1918, the, the dialogue that um, uh, I referred to um, earlier, uh, at the Feast of the Gods, um, he does put it into the, into the mouth of the old, Tsarist, the old Tsarist general. And thus, when a liberal figure known as the diplomat 
declares the 2nd of March will always will be for him always a joyous date. The Tsarist general corrects him in terms that remind us of, of Bulgakov's autobiography. For me, it was the most horrible and saddest of days, truly a day of death. It became clear to me at once that the war was over and irrevocably lost, that our Russia was ruined. Really, what the devil would we do with Constantinople without a Tsar? Are we supposed to go there with Papa Milyukov and dear Kerensky? Better to let the Turkish Sultan remain there with the surviving Turks, the protectors of ancient Islamic piety. In Bulgakov's historical and geographical semiotics, therefore, Hagia Sophia uh, becomes the symbol of an ideal regime type that Bulgakov calls Theokratia. And for Bulgakov, it was the ideal regime type. To reduce its, to a, uh, its essentials, Theokratia was a human polity ob ordered objectively. That is according to values lodged in an order or form of truth, the Logos and, 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 and its sort of counterpart, created counterpart, Holy Sophia, um, that was external to itself and which somebody in, in Bulgakov's scheme, the Tsar, had at the end of the day to ensure that it conformed. Its opposite value in Bulgakov's um, uh, sort of political um, taxonomy was the expressly secular regime of democracy that in March 1917 had overthrown, um, albeit as Bulgakov himself recognized, the deeply flawed theocracy of Nicholas II. Um, uh, uh, in the name of breaking uh, the connection between the cosmic order and the human political regime. For this reason, the disgust that Bulgakov felt at the thought of the provisional government in Constantinople and Hagia Sophia was properly speaking a form of desolation. It wasn't that if the people's tribunes, Milyukov or Kerensky, appeared in, in Hagia Sophia, something sacred would have been profaned. No, it was sort of the, the more deeper, the deeper point that if they did so, it would be a sign in itself that the sacred itself had been abolished, or that man had persuaded himself um, to believe that it had. In other words, I think we can say that for Bulgakov, um, the, the real meaning of the Russian Revolution, for all its diverse proximate causes, was religious. The Russian Revolution symbolized, and in some sense realized, not least in the destruction um, in, of the Tsar's body, the death of the sacred, certainly in, in terms of its political connection to the world. In this site, Bulgakov already in 1918 had anticipated the essence of the work of the Italian Catholic philosopher of history, Augusto del Noce in the 1960s, 1970s and 80s. Contemporary history, says del Noce, is philosophical history, meaning that since the Russian revolution, world history has represented the working out in time and matter of the chief truth, so to speak, discovered in 19th century philosophy, the death of the sacred through the immanentization of God first in the mind by way of the idealist philosophy of Kant, and then supremely in the expressly atheist philosophy of history of Marx. For this reason, the Russian Revolution, which brought about the overthrow of Europe's last sacred polis, so to speak, the Russian Tsardom, in favor of a regime of secularized Kantian Christianity in the February Revolution, only to give way to the world's first expressly atheist re regime in October, possessed a conjunctural value greater than itself as the expression of the definitive judgment of history in favor of secular secularization. After the Russian Revolution, says Del Noce, secularity is simply assumed as the default um, mode or governing logic of the historical process everywhere. A social trend or development, an event, a political figure, movement or party is rational, true, just, good, and to be welcomed to the extent that it conforms to the logic of secularization. Trends or events that do not conform to this logic, that challenge, resist, or seek to reverse it, must be irrational, untrue, unjust, bad, the product of false consciousness, a fantasy, um, or, the, or the product of the cynical manipulation of myths. For the Western reader, Donace, however, um, has a particular sting in the tail. And that is that while this philosophical judgment in favor of secularization was first realized historically in Russia, it reached its fulfillment um, uh, not in the Soviet Union. Um, there, paradoxically, the very 19th century character of Marxism kept alive in its utopianism and its messianism, a sec secularized simulacrum of the Christian God, of the very Christian God it sought to replace. Rather, the fulfillment of the process of secularization or the judgment in favor of secularization was made in the West. That is to say to Del Noce, 
in the, in the rejection made on the deepest level of the human person of any order of external truth um, uh, higher than the, the, the so-called truth of sexual desire. The sexual revolution of the 1960s possesses what value it does in world history as the culminating revelation of the death of the sacred. To Del Noche, the Western sexual revolution proceeds from, discloses, and wherever it is introduced, inaugurates a judgment in favor of secularization. By contrast, even at the height of the Cold War and with Marxists in the Kremlin, the surprising historical philosophical value of Russian civilization, as Del Noche saw it, lay in the residual survival there of a sense of the sacred. Thus, Del Noche in 1970 could say, the idea of the holy city as an ordering center is essential to affirm the reality of the sacred in general. And it is unquestionably true that Russia constitutes the last bastion of the sacral mindset in the field of politics, who after all in the West still thinks of a connection between politics and the sacred. Um, end quotation. Given the accelerated secularization of Western society since the 1970s and the public revival of orthodoxy in Russia since the fall of communism, it seemed escapable, inescapable to me that historically, philosophically speaking, the value assigned um, by Donacci to Russia um, uh, hasn't significantly changed uh, on the contrary. Um, by now, I think it, it should also be evident why the Turkish government's um, announcement two years ago to restore Hagia Sophia, if you sort of consider Bulgakov's sort of semiotics um, of, of history and geography alongside the, the sort of philosophy of history, both he and, and um, Del Noce um, gesture towards. Um, why, that, why the Turkish government's uh, decision to sort of uh, uh, de-secularize, so to speak, Hagia Sophia, elicited from Western leaders the outcry it did. Um, sensing the underlying symbolism, symbolism they saw in Hagia Sophia's desecularization, uh, de de an attempt to reverse the 20th century consensus that historical pro progress meant the death of the sacred, sacred. Um, or better that the logic of the historical process itself was always towards secularization. Um, uh, um, indeed, the, the parrot, uh, what's also striking, indeed, the sovereignty of, of, of a logic of secularization in history um, uh, was also revealed in the apparent inability of the Western commentariat to conceive of motives for Erdogan's behavior that were not cynical, that were not about power. On the assumption that religion possesses no value in itself, Erdogan's relationship to Islam can only be in, instrumental. And perhaps, of course, in reality it is, but it's the universality of that judgment that's striking, that there is no, as it were, alternative innocent explanation. Uh, to paraphrase Del Noche, the paradox of the age of secularization is that when it comes to religion, only irreligion is to be credited, is to be credited with sincerity, at least in the public sphere. Are we obliged to agree? That's the question I'd like to uh, ask at this point. Must history obey a logic, indeed a law of secularization that enjoys its own rights over the historical process? Um, rights that once exercised are irreversible um, and may not even be challenged um, or resisted in good faith. Um, I think the question is, in, is pertinent in regard to what's, uh, it's the war currently taking place in Ukraine. Because surely one of its most striking features um, certainly in terms of this um, post-Cold War era that we live in, um, has been the, the role assumed uh, in public discussion about it um, uh, by religion. Uh, on the Russian side, of course, um, uh, the, uh, the invasion has been justified by Putin and by uh, Patriarch Kirill um, as a defense of you know, Russian Orthodox civilization against Western secularization, and indeed you know, against aspects of the Western sexual revolution. On the Western side, of course, those same Russian claims have been met with dismissal um, and with disdain. Um, uh, when Russians invoke such civilizational themes, or when they invoke the sacred, the Russians are, of course, lying. Um, uh, those terms aren't relevant. Um, they're not necessarily even real. Um, besides, um, all, Ukraine, uh, all Ukrainians want is democracy. But the question that I think that you know, reading Bulgakov and Donoche raises is that is, is it necessary for the Russians to be lying to be lying about the civilizational issues at stake, for Western critics of Russian behavior to be right about Ukraine's democratic aspirations. After all, does anybody seriously doubt that the effect at least 
of Ukraine's integration into the Euro-Atlantic world would not be secularization. And that if for some reason it wasn't, pressure would be brought to bear as it has on Hungary and Poland to ensure um, that it was. Um, an important document I think to consider in this regard is a document that Professor um, Mearsheimer, who's been mentioned several other times in this uh, session, um, has, drew to attention, has drawn to attention in his writings on the subject. Uh, and that's the um, uh, uh, US-Ukraine Charter on Strategic Partnership signed at the end of last year. Um, that lays out a whole, a whole range of, of um, strategic, military and political arrangements that need to take place um, in order to um, uh, ensure Ukraine's full integration into the European and Euro-Atlantic institutions. And Mearsheimer, naturally enough, as a realist um, in international relations terms, focuses on those. But in a way that wouldn't have surprised either Del Noce or Bulgakov, the Charter also realizes um, a certain spiritual or religious logic, and that's that of secularization. Thus, in Section 23, Democracy and the Rule of Law, the Charter lays out a whole range of things that Bulgakov would recognize, the selenements of the Western legal state um, that was sort of the antinomy of his conception of the theokratia. Um, in particular, of particular importance, of course, is, is point five, which commits Ukraine to advancing um, respect for human rights, fundamental freedoms, um, the fight against racism, xenophobia, um, and members of the LGBTQI plus um, communities. Now, I think here in terms of the, the, the scheme that Bulgakov and Del Noce uh, lay out, whatever the claims, of course, of, of, of people who identify in those terms, uh, whatever the legitimate nature of the claims of people who identify in those terms are, uh, as the cipher of, of an ideology, those last seven characters uh, of that clause contain the whole logic of the Western sexual revelation, uh, revolution. And so far from only the effect it seems that the declared intention, at least in philosophical historical terms, of the United States relationship with Ukraine is to promote um, secularization. And as an empire of liberalism, um, isn't the, the United States and the, the, the broader Euro-Atlantic world an empire precisely of secularization? Um, so I think that in, to conclude, you know, reading events today through the eyes of Bulgakov um, and Del Noce, um, you know, the, uh, the war in Ukraine could be considered um, the latest chapter of the Russian Revolution, inseparable from the world war um, that was its setting. Um, uh, Adrian, are you uh, ready to, to wrap up? Yes, please. Yeah. yeah. Including. Okay. Uh, well, um, uh, I, I'll, I, I think I'll leave it there. Um, uh, just with perhaps with this final um, uh, uh, final point, you know, Bulgakov um, in in his dialogue in 1918 makes makes the observation that if the existence um, of an independent state system is still in any way justified in history, then it is precisely through the existence of the orthodox Sardom. In other words. Um, the only limit on an empire of secularization is a civilization state that still acknowledges the claims of the sacred. Um, um, uh, and, and I think from reading Bulgakov, whatever the claims um, of, of the Russian government, whether they're sincere or whether they're lying, uh, I think that Bulgakov and probably Del Noce would agree that um, the, the religious significance of events um, uh, is inscribed uh, much more objectively in the historical philosophical logic um, of the preceding century. Thank you. Great. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Matthew, and thanks to all of our uh, presenters. Uh, now, the audience has been incredibly patient, um, so I really uh, am very keen now to bring you all in and to um, have questions and, and discussion. Can we uh, take uh, two or three questions at a time, uh, brief if possible, but then also have brief answers so that we can take lots more than just three questions. I'll bring in the presenters as they either are asked directly or if they wish to comment, but let's keep both questions and answers relatively short uh, so that we can have several rounds. Uh, who would like to start? I can see various hands up. Um, Andrew, I'm going to go to Andrew, Mark, Casey, and then we'll have a second round. Um, so Andrew, let me start with you. Uh, Thank you so much. 
Uh, may I please ask a question of Matthew about that extraordinarily rich presentation? And specifically, I wanted to ask about Turkey, which is sometimes characterized as a civilizational state, not always, but I wanted to ask whether you think there's a sort of admixture of, quote, secular and sacred dimensions in Turkey, whether or not it's a civilizational state, Erdogan, neo-Ottomanism on the one hand, but still the Ataturk legacy on the other, NATO membership, and yet exclusion from the EU for a host of reasons, disclaiming the Armenian genocide, as well as religious questions. But it's almost reminiscent of the admixture of secularization and the sacred that you refer to in Bulgakov's reflection on the early Soviet Union. So if you'd be willing to comment on that specifically with respect to Turkey, I'd be grateful. Thank you. Uh, sure. I mean, I, 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 sorry, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, Matthew, can yeah. we just yeah. take the three questions? Because depending on... Oh, sure. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, sorry. 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 Yeah. Let's do that. Yeah. So Mark and then, uh, and then Casey. Thank you all. Uh, my question is very simple. Was Sam Huntington right? Uh, as it turns out, I have a personal interest in your answer of this. Uh, my partner in forming the Center for Study of Digital Life, uh, the Section Naval Intelligence, and in fact, uh, studied with Sam Huntington. Another um, colleague of mine was the one who attempted and failed to get the Council on Foreign Relations to pay attention to Sam Huntington uh, in the 90s. Uh, was Sam Huntington right? Thank you, Mark. Um, Casey. <clears throat> Yeah, I uh, thank you all. Uh, my question I, is mostly for, I guess, Matthew, but it was touched on a little bit in the other papers as well. What about some of the uh, genuinely Christian roots of secularization? Uh, you know, Denmark, you no know, better secularizers than Soren Kierkegaard. Would. And so, you know, I, I was wondering, you know, how, you know, you're putting Bogenkov and Del Noche. Uh, in terms of you know, civilizational states and states that acknowledge the sacred. Um, but there's also a whole other aspect of Christianity that's rather secularizing in itself. It doesn't mean it's, it's necessarily um, secularist in the liberal sense. That we okay, so thank you for those three questions. Um, let's start with Andrew's and then Casey's because they're both directed at Matthew. And then I'll ask Matthew, but indeed the others to come in on, you know, was Samuel Huntington right or wrong? Uh, your answers can be longer than one word answers, which might help the, the discussion. But Matthew, first of all, to you. Okay, uh, I wish I, I wish I knew more about Turkey to answer uh, specifically about Turkey um, um, in the way that you asked. But, but I think that you, I think that you're absolutely right. Um, what I do know more about is Russia, and I think that precisely that conflict between um, uh, sort of um, uh, aspects uh, of the structure of the state and of the society that are sort of civilizational in inspiration, and others that are precisely secularized, is precisely um, part of the part of the tension um, that um, characterizes um, Russia today. In fact, um, you know, it, it's quite clear that you know, Russia is not, um, certainly in Bulgakov's sense, um, you know, a theokratia today. Um, it, it wasn't um, it, it wasn't um, perfectly one before the revolution either, but um, in, in, a, in an even more um, uh, striking way, um, it's not one today. In, in that sense, the secularization uh, inaugurated or, 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 or in the revolution can't be can't be undone. There's an element of secularization that even um, uh, Russian culture feels incapable of reversing. You know, I don't think that we will have again another czar uh, anointed um, by the church um, in Russia as we did before the revolution. So there's an element of irreversibility about. The, the secularization aspect um, of the historical project process, even when when it's challenged, um, even when it's um, uh, contested, and I think that that's a problem um, for both Russia and Turkey um, in different ways. Um, so I'll, uh, I'll just go to the uh, to the other point about um, whether Christianity, uh, sort of the sort of secularizing elements of Christianity itself, and I think that you know. Uh, Fully, I recognise um, the the thrust of that question, but I think what the question 
misses is how, um, uh, it, it, well, what the question confuses is Christianity with Western Christianity. I think that Western Christianity, yes, um, uh, does um, uh, contain essential central uh, secularizing elements. Um, but whether that would have been clear to anybody before, um, let's say, the 11th century, um, before the Gregorian reform, um, before the entire sort of um, cultural um, and political um, philosophical um, reconfiguration of the relationship between church and state that was inaugurated um, by the Gregorian reform. Um, whether people would have asserted that before that time, I don't think so. And, and, and I think that um, uh, uh, I, I think that we have to be careful to not conflate the sort of the, the Western experience um, of Christianity and secularization with sort of the general experience of Christianity and secularization. And I think that quite pointedly, um, Russia offers uh, an alternative um, model of that relationship that uh, I can't see as being any less um, you know, normative on its own terms. Thank you uh, very much, Matthew. Um, may I turn to Richard and Paul on the question asked by Mark about Samuel Huntington. Um, Richard, go ahead and then Paul. Yeah, uh, I'm afraid that I'm going to have to go in a few minutes. So I'll, maybe I'll just take this one. I, I thought this session was going to end at, well, our time, 11.30, 10.30, whatever time it is over there. But anyway, he was half right. I think that uh, we're in the, the idea, you know, he talked about these huge civilizational complexes and clearly, uh, they're, they're important in the sense that they draw attention to the sort of factors we've just been talking about, which is that uh, modern nation state is more than just simply a project of uh, modernity. It's rooted in traditions and it's got a it's more complex relationship in state and society. On the other hand, if we're going to be talking about the dynamics of international politics, clearly uh, civilizations are not uh, the agents, if you like, in the interaction of uh, of engagement, as it were, and it operates at a different level, an important one, but not the one in which perhaps the fundamental rationality of interstate relations. And, you know, more and more I'm coming back to this sort of very hard vision, the fact that we manage to slip into, as I say, this march of folly at the present time, because perhaps we took the eye off the ball, and, you know, Huntington may have helped doing that, uh, of the fundamental question is that of statecraft, that you know the modern state and the nation state is engaged in, it's, it's, it is the actor in the international system in which we have to work in. So uh, he, he, you know, he said important things, but you know, states don't engage, uh, I mean, civilizations are not the actors in international politics and they cross cut. You know, you have relations with Christian Armenia, with uh, uh, Islamic Iran and others, other aspects. Um, so uh, no, he, he, was only, he, he, he said important things. And so the dismissal of the Samuel Huntington argument too often was too easy. I mean, for example, he did talk about Ukraine as a cleft state. Yes, and that was quite clearly a perceptive comment. So I don't think you should dismiss him entirely, but I think that uh, it, it was on the, you know, it, 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 if we go too far along the Huntingtonian path, then we maybe fail to see the important aspect, as I say, of, of you know, necessary modern statecraft. And I'm afraid on that note, I'll, I'll have to slip off. So thank you very much for your yeah. attention. Thank you, Richard. I had one or two questions about Russia, but- uh, you, you, I mean, I could wait a couple more minutes if that, could, no. Yeah. You're gonna have to I, straight away? If, if it's possible, uh, no, no. Of course, if you have if you have commitments, then we won't we won't hold you back. I just had one, if I may, very brief question because you started your paper with this notion of self interest and how you know perhaps it wasn't in this in the United States self interest to uh, act in the way that it has. How about Russia's self interest now that the war has uh, has started? Um, what does that mean for Russia's future, and what does it tell us about where Russia is going? Since ultimately the decision to go to war was one taken by by Russia. Russia wasn't attacked. Russia decided to launch this war, albeit in the context that you have described. So what, what does that tell us about 
whether this is in Russia's self-interest and where Russia is heading. I mean, if you have two minutes or... No, no, I do. Thank you very much for that question. It's the one, it, this is the 65,000 ruble question. It really is the fundamental issue. In my view, this uh, decision to invade has epical significance. All that we've said, said and studied about Russia for, uh, for years uh, has, has been thrown, not into doubt, but I think needs to be reevaluated because this is the first time really in, this, in, in the sense that Russia has engaged in a war without honor, if you like, that uh, it's one that is going to overshadow. In fact, it, perhaps it's perhaps, you know, Russia's had endless, you know, we're talking about in the modern era, uh, Russia has been invaded since 1800 on average every 30 years. So almost all of its wars have been defensive in one way or another, perhaps it's instigated them in, in uh, covert ways. But this was the first time a war of, well, as you say, the structural factors, and it, it is going to have devastating consequences for the society for generations to come, not just even on a material level, but on the spiritual level as well, the, the cultural and such like. It's a, you know, you could say it's a catastrophe of unprecedented proportions for its effect on Russia itself. So you're absolutely right to, to put that. I'm not sure how the society and the culture and its sense of honor and dignity of itself is going to be reconstituted because so much in this war is premised on dishonesty, misrepresentation, and you know, not to say there weren't you know, factors involved of the sort we can talk about, but you know, I don't go along with the simple Mersheimer argument that Russia is behaving like any great state in its position would do. And and, and you could, he would even, and others of that ilk would even go further. It does not differ in a substantive sense of the way you know, the United States invaded Iraq earlier and all the other wars, which we can talk about, the bombing of Serbia in 1999, in which 3,000 people died, et cetera, et cetera. All of that is true. Yet, for Russia, as uh, in this context, to attack a, you know, a brotherly nation in, in this way, is going to have epical significance, and it's going to be long-term. And you know, whether the existing regime survives or not is only part of it but it's going to take decades and decades for, how can I put it, Russia to be accepted as a, you know, as, as a worthy interlocutor, let's put it this way. Uh, and in, even internally, it's going to take a long time for the sinews and the texture of the society to come back together. I mean, as you know, tens of thousands of intelligentsia have, have fled abroad, that the society is deeply divided, deeply divided, and that um, uh, it's not clear on what basis the reintegration as a, as a you know, of self-image and self-honor is going to be able to be reconstituted. Um, I mean, maybe I'm being rather pessimistic and apocalyptic, and many people are criticizing me even here to say, no, it's just normal realist statism. But this is far bigger than that. It's, uh, as I say, it, it's going to be, it's echo, it's going to echo down the ages. Well, thank you so much, Richard, for uh, ducking out of the ISA to join us, for uh, staying on a little longer. We have slightly prolonged the session, but thank you so much. And uh, can we just... Uh, show our appreciation and we'll move on to the other questions. Thanks again, Richard, very much for joining us. So uh, we'll carry on with Paul, who has no doubt things to say about whether Sam Huntington was right or not, Paul, and then we'll do the next round of questions. Yeah, very good. Uh, thank you. Um, yes, I, I, I thought of, and wrote about uh, Huntington uh, for, for many years, so I, I'm eager to to get some thoughts on that. The, um, there was a statement made about World War II um, in, in Gabor's uh, presentation, which I think is relevant to this uh, because uh, the, the, the Russian civilizational idea, if Krylov is right, um, is, is really very much focused on sort of this battle against metaphysical evil. And, and, and so the, the myth of World War II um, is absolutely central to Russia's identity, but, but it's only one such case of, 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 that, uh, of that taking place. I mean, the, 
the battle against Napoleon, I mean, there's, there's, this is a repeated theme. Uh, but, and, and the fact of Ukraine uh, in, in the perspective of, uh, of the Russian civilization, because of the West of Ukraine embracing people who gave the opposite interpretation to the meaning of World War II, um, where, where the victory of, of the USSR was, was in fact the defeat and it was itself the evil, uh, makes the clash between that interpretation of what Ukraine is and what Russia is um, all the more inevitable. But I, I, the other point I, I want to quickly make, since I know we don't have much time, and this builds on something that Richard said, is that the clash of civilizations um, is taking place clearly within Ukraine, which something which Huntington uh, emphasized uh, more, much more so than Mearsheimer, who looked at it as, as, as a state conflict between Russia and Ukraine, both, by the way, predicted war uh, what was likely to come. Um, but, the, but the clash of civilizations now is taking place very much within Russia. Um, and the, a, a point that I wanted to make, but I cut out for the sake of time, I think is, is important is that what I see in Russia today, and I follow uh, internal discussions uh, daily and, 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 and so in, in detail, um, is that there, there's a whole, there's a large group of, of Russians who see their civilizational conflict with the West as being about um, saying no to technocracy of the Davos style sort of project, uh, World Economic Forum and technocracy and so forth. And they, 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 they are well familiar with the writings of Yuval Harari and his, what, what they view as his post-humanist uh, project. And see, that is an evil that Russia is called upon to, to defend. And then echoing what Matthew said, you know, the gender revolution, uh, revolution uh, ideas in the West, they also see as, as, as an evil to be resisted. And there's, there's hundreds of thousands of people in chats and in, in, in Telegram who rally around this civilizational idea. And inevitably they support this war. And even though there are people like Mezhuev, um, who's also a civilizational person, but he's also a realist and he's very much against the war and wants to bring it to a, a conclusion as possible. So there's no hard and fast lines between the groups, but I think I think that it's very important uh, not to forget that the uh, that the, the, the civilizational conflict exists, but exists not only between states but within them. Thank you, Paul. Um, Gabo has asked for the floor, so Gabo, please over to you. Thank you. Uh, just a footnote to uh, what uh, Richard Sackler told. In these weeks, it becomes clear for many Russians that their understanding of Russian civilization and the elite's understanding of uh, Russian civilization are different, are different and uh, maybe uh, antithetical. It doesn't follow from it uh, that there will be a Russian uh, revolution in the coming weeks, but something starts in the heads and uh, hearts of uh, Russian people. Great, thank you, uh, Gabor. Next round of questions. Let me see who's got their hand up. Uh, Russell, the gentleman behind them, and the lady at the back. I'm sorry, I don't yet know your names, but no doubt you will introduce yourselves. Can we start with Russell, please? Thank you, Adrian, and thank you all for these uh, important uh, presentations. Uh, in, in different ways, all of the presenters uh, gave, as far as I'm concerned, some of the best accounts of what might be going on in the Russian market. Today. This is the question that comes up again and again in the, in the U.S. press. So, uh, do the Russian people support this or not? I'm not sure we've answered that, but at least you've opened the door to some possible Russian perspective on this. My, my, my question, I suppose, might have been primarily for, for Richard, but uh, I'll make this a, a comment and please reply as you like. Um, I think positing Russia as a civilization in the sense of this conference uh, leads us to uh, the West as a liberal civilization, uh, and then to try to deduce Western behavior 
as a consequence of that civilization, as a consequence of that liberalism. What that might lead us to miss, I think, is the ambiguity in the Western response to, to Ukraine. There's clearly a large public outcry of support for Ukraine, but in my estimation, what's come out of Washington, what's come out of Berlin and Paris and Brussels is pretty half-hearted. Uh, it's as if leading powers in the West really don't want Ukraine to win. They want to put a stop to the Russian application of international borders, but they're not interested in getting them to Poland. Uh, and therefore, they are um, shortchanging uh, <coughs> on, the, uh, on the weapons they, uh, that, that have been provided. So that, I think, would complicate the picture if we see the West as internally divided as much as, the, as, as Russia. Thank you very much, Russell. Please introduce yourself. And, uh, yeah. Um, a question for, um, for Paul. Um, if we adopt Krilov's perspective of the West, I suppose that we also, also in this in this conference, we need to break down the West. So, from the Russian perspective, are the are the Americans as bad as the French? Is the West <laughs> capitalism? Is the West NATO? Is the West the latest U.S. foreign policy by Pompeo? So, I think is when when they look at the West and they dislike the West, what? How do they break it down? Are they, are, is there one big evil and little evils there? Priority. So I think it's important to to really look at that colossal entity and be a little bit analytical about it, instead of just adopting this. We run with the West and we know what we're talking about. Thank you, Fernando, and the lady at the back. Right, thank you. <laughs> yeah. um, may I turn to uh, Matthew first on some of the questions or indeed the comment from, from Russell, uh, but also Fernando's question, then Paul and then Gabor as well, if he wishes to. So Matthew, may I turn to you first? Um, it might be best to go to uh, somebody else, Adrian, because I'm still thinking through um, the uh, the implications of, <laughs> of, of, of Russell's question. And and the last the last the last question, I'm afraid, Adrian, I couldn't hear. Okay, we we will yeah. have that yeah asked again. But then maybe yeah. I turn to Paul on the question of you know um, how do how do Russians think about the West and is there the um, division that Russell also uh, mentioned? in terms of responses to the war in Ukraine. Paul. Yeah, uh, I also, like Matthew, I couldn't, I, I, I could hear the question that was directed to me, but the, the, the woman in the back who asked a question, I couldn't understand a, a word uh, of that. So maybe we could repeat that. <laughs> <a little. laughs> um, it's a microphone. But, I, but I, I would like to respond to the question about Krilov and, and, and the different West. So. Oh, forgive me one second. Gabo, could you possibly mute yourself? That would be, um, that would be fantastic. Thank you. Sorry, Paul, to cut across. Uh, okay. <laughs> Sorry, Gabo. That that that's great. Thank you. So, Paul, please go ahead. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I I did um, try to cut down my the, the the length of my presentation since so that we could include it, everyone today. Um, but had in the in the fuller version of the paper, I, I did try to address uh, to some extent that that very question is is that for for Krilov at any rate um, the West included everywhere that the, the particular ethic of liberalism as he defined it was, was present. So the West is Australia, it's New Zealand, it's, um, it's South Africa to a great extent, as well as uh, uh, Western Europe and, and the United States and Canada. That's the West to the extent that they all adhere to this, um, to the ethical system that he described. Um, the, 
you know, again, he's writing in 1995, 96, I think that to a great extent, uh, it would appear that what he defined as the do as I do, as opposed to the more tolerant uh, live and let live version of, of liberalisms has, has, only, has only gained ground um, and within uh, pretty much that same space. Now, in the case of somewhere like Japan uh, or North Korea, I think it's, it's much more ambiguous uh, to what extent they are liberal states in that sense. I think that's very questionable. They're, they're clearly hybrid. Um, and I, I think Krilov would certainly agree to that. But by no means was it a matter of um, just the United States or just NATO for, for, uh, from, from Krilov's perspective. I, I hope that suffices. Yeah, thank you, Paul, for that um, clarification. Matthew, would you like to come in now or should I turn to Gabo first? Um, no, just uh, just I think on Russell's point, I mean, I think it's um, uh, I probably don't have much more to add other than um, uh, I think what you see in the sort of ambivalence or, or the um, uh, the difference between sort of the, 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 the very great sense of public um, uh, outrage, and certainly here in Denmark, you know, there's apparently universal consensus in favour of the justness of the Ukrainian cause, um, and and I think the Danish government is probably too insignificant in world affairs. Um, uh, to uh, to be in a position to need to um, uh, step aside from that, but I think it's simply um, you know the, the emotivism of, of of the of the public realm. The difference between the, sort of the emotivism of, of the public realm, which you know I think there are obvious philosophical um, uh, uh, causes for origins to, um, and um, uh, an emotivism that is constrained within the halls of government by the sheer reality of having to deal um, with um, uh, with the very dangerous nature. Nature, um, of, um, of, you know, of nuclear arsenals and sort of the actual real consequences that might flow from taking that emotionalism um, to, um, to, to the point that the, the public might sort of expect that emotionalism to be taken. I think it's, I mean, that's how I can see, that's how I understand the difference between those two things. Okay, thank you. Um, let, let's have the question from Leah again, and then I'll start with Garbo so that he has a chance to come in. Can we Activate the microphone in such a way that everyone can hear Leah, please. No, I don't think that microphone works. Do you want to use this one? Um, th thank you. I'm sorry that you couldn't hear me. Um, yeah, my question was related to the the conflict in, in, in Ukraine, Russia started this war. So we have heard about this expression by President Biden about this new world order. So I, I wanted to ask you about how you conceive uh, this international scenario. If we are gonna go through a new reconfiguration of the international order, uh, it's gonna be like some sort of bipolar, like thinking about the Cold War situation or not, on the contrary, maybe it's gonna be multipolar with uh, different uh, strategies and alliances between nations and international organizations to preserve peace, democracy, freedom. Any other ideas? <laughs> we'll be really delighted to, to hear. Thank you so much. That's a great question. Um, uh, to add one more before we do final round, because we are going to wrap up just at about one o'clock, so in a few minutes. So if I may very briefly abuse uh, my, my, my position as chair to ask a question, I think probably mostly directed at um, Paul and, um, and Matthew, um, which is what do you make of some of the divisions within uh, the Russian Orthodox Church in response to the wars? On the one hand, we had uh, Patriarch Kirill's uh, response. On the other hand, uh, Onufrius, the Metropolitan of Kiev, on the first day of the war spoke out against it, as have some 300 uh, Russian Orthodox priests, both in Russia and um, and elsewhere, as well as, of course, lots and lots of letters signed by Orthodox theologians around the world questioning, uh, you know, the, 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 the justness, in effect, being very clear that they think this is a wholly unjust war on a, you know, a fratricidal war on a, on a brotherly a nation, not to mention that it's taking place during during the Great Lent. And, and then related to that, what does that tell us about the relationship between church and state and the you know well-known you know accusation that you know there are tendencies of Caesar or papism that perhaps you know cast a rather different light on the relationship, you know, compared with precisely the vision that you were outlining, Matthew, which is one where actually the church is not subordinate to the state. 
and the free theocracy uh, you know that's uh, advocated is just the opposite where the state is much more uh, sort of responding to you know some of the moral um, um, you know arguments that would be made you know by 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 the church so just wondering how you would how you would respond to that so let's start with Gabo maybe on the question asked by Leah but of course you can also uh, comment on that and then I'll turn to Paul and to Matthew as well and we'll wrap up well, in five minutes. Uh, well very briefly uh, I don't think that uh, the church is that much of a player in today's Russia. It's decorative, uh, it's patriarch, is a, a silly old fellow, but uh, the church isn't really an authority. Uh, people don't care that much about uh, it. Uh, what Kirill and uh, Putin <coughs> say about the West, it's very simple. Uh, for them, liberalism, democracy uh, don't exist. The only thing they uh, emphasize is LGBT rights. That uh, the West is depraved. And uh, of course, uh, it's a negative imprint that Russia represent, represents high moral values. Nothing more, nothing more. When it comes to the justification of this war, no civilization is involved on the one hand because uh, uh, it, they claim, the Russian official discourse claims that uh, Russians and Ukrainians share the same civilization. And on the other hand, uh, they cannot claim easily that it is a confrontation, a direct confrontation between uh, uh, Russia and the West, because uh, these poor Ukrainians don't belong uh, to the West for them. So, uh, well, uh, it's, a, it's a tricky issue. Uh, now, uh, for uh, uh, the Russians, since uh, the revolution, at least, the West is always uh, a problem because on the one hand, they understand it as, uh, as a military threat or political threat. And the other hand, they can't tell, they can't sell the West uh, to their populations as something which shouldn't be followed. I can't uh, stress enough that bread and butter issues can't. And for uh, the average Russian today, the West is still uh, uh, the realm of high tech and, uh, and uh, all sorts of coveted uh, goods and advantages. So uh, the official discourse, Putin's, or if you uh, like it, uh, the patriarchs, can't have anything substantial against the West. The only thing they, uh, they uh, emphasize is sexual depravity, nothing more. How long it will appeal to, uh, to Russians, to the average Russian? It's hard to say. But anyway, I can't stress enough that uh, the anti-Western discourse is, uh, is completely uh, primitive. They can't even uh, stress too much uh, the military aspect of the thing because uh, the every Russian mustn't be a, a fine strategist to discover that it's completely indifferent if uh, those rockets, NATO rockets are this or that side of, uh, of the border. They'll arrive uh, to Moscow or to, uh, to anywhere uh, a bit, uh, I don't know if you have five uh, seconds uh, sooner or later. Thank you. Thank you, Gabba. Matthew. Um, I think it's a really interesting question, Adrian, and it's one that Bulgakov, in, sent, in a sense, in his 
um, perspicacity already dramatizes um, in 1918, this sort of discussion between, uh, he stages as a, as a dialogue between two different churchmen, um, uh, a churchman that you know, sort of reflects his own sort of more theocratic thinking and a churchman that he um, is sort of, sort of the cadet um, constitutional democratic style churchman. And the question I think between them comes down to the point that Dolnoce makes. You either think that the idea of the Holy City um, as um, um, uh, as an ordering center is essential to is essential for affirming the reality of the sacred, or you don't. Um, and um, uh, I think that um, certainly the, um, the, uh, the 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 document signed by the theologi the, the Orthodox theologians that you mentioned um, comes down very strongly on the idea uh, on the side of the idea that you know um, a holy city um, is not essential to affirm the sacred um, but to, to affirm the reality of the sacred um, and that's the sort of theological um, or philosophical nub um, of the distinction. I think that it's complicated because then you have a third position, and this is the kind of position that I'd associate it with people like, like Mijuev, uh, um, Paul, and that is that they do affirm um, the necessity of a holy city um, uh, uh, for affirming the, the, the reality of the sacred, but um, they still disagree that with the necessity of this war. In other words, the holy city doesn't have to realize itself in the whole civilizational space um, in which it has, in which it has claims to make. Um, uh, it, it's enough um, that it that it, it it affirm itself only in part of that space. Um, uh, you know, it, it's possible to to to, to lose. Um, Ukraine to the Ruski Mir um, and and preserve it in Russia. Um, you know that um, you know there's there's an attractive I think um, sense of um, uh, humanity perhaps about that position, but but the, the it's the realism of it that that I that um, I think is interesting. Um, is it is it it doesn't doesn't the whole you know it doesn't at some point. Um, uh, 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 sort of the, the, the protection of, or sort of the, the assertion of, of, the, of the existence of a sacred order require precisely um, uh, you know, sort of uh, forceful, um, uh, forceful expression. Um, uh, and that's sort of the, I mean, I, that's how I see the, the nub of the, the debate. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, and finally, Paul. Um, yeah, it, 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 it indeed is uh, a, a real shame that Richard uh, couldn't hang on for that uh, for Vita's question about the New World Order that was clearly tailor-made for him. I, I'll just very briefly uh, say that I mean, what, what I see happening uh, as a um, pretty obviously is in, it's not just Russia and China. We see Russia and China and apparently India um, and in some sense Brazil are and in, in, in quite a number of other countries seem to be forming a bipolar order uh, with the I mean, none of those none of those areas, uh, including uh, South America and Africa, um, are are joining in the boycott uh, of Russia. And uh, despite calls to do so, there seem to be some civil some commonalities there. It, it may be there, there's a, a civilizations of the east and the north. Are, are, are going to uh, rally against the civilization of the West. That's, but that's all I'll say on that subject because I know we don't have much time. Uh, regarding the role of the Russian church, um, Adrian, I, th I think that fortunately uh, Matthew answered that uh, first and he's in a better position than I, I think to, to, to give um, a professional view there. But what, at, answering more sociologically, um, again, you know, reading widely about discussion, the discussions going on in Russia today, I think it would be wrong to uh, to view Russia as a static thing. That we this is what it is. Russia Russia is becoming something different all of the time, and and the, and the current conflict is putting enormous pressure on people to clarify uh, what is their what is spiritually most important to them, and I. I, what I'm saying in, 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 is, is repeatedly, despite the alleged um, indifference of the Russian people to the Orthodox Church um, and, and claims that the Russian Church doesn't mean anything at all, 
because its patriarch is allegedly ridiculous, um, I, I see religious language creeping into absolutely every statement by ordinary people and their comments about what is going on, including if they see Ukrainians suffering from this war, and they, they see people from Mariupol whose homes have been devastated uh, because of the war. Um, and, you see, and I read the comments of hundreds and hundreds of people say, not a single one of them has the word God absent from their comment, saying, you know, God help these people, God pray, you know, I, we need to pray for these people, what a tragedy this is. It's all expressed in, in, in religious terms, in religious language. I, I think that that um, it would be, it, it's a mistake to think that the secularization of Russia is, is the final intuition or is what, what needs to be understood about, uh, about Russia today. It, Russia is changing. Uh, and as for the, the, the church's position, I'll, I, I, um, I, I agree with, with Matthew's comments, so I won't add any more. Okay, well, we have um, much exceeded the, the time that was uh, allocated, so I will now uh, draw this to a close. Uh, can I start by thanking um, uh, the audience for their incredible patience, but also all the, the excellent questions and comments. Uh, and please join me in thanking our panelists, uh, Paul Grenier, Matthew Del Santo, and Gabor Ritter-Sporn for their very rich presentations. Thank you.